Don't you realize what's happening? The Americans are striking. They're coming here. And basically what we're going to do, they're going to pay us to do the, the jobs of the Americans at a, a fraction of the rate in which the Americans are given. Mm -hmm. And we're basically selling them out, you know? Yeah. And I, I, as soon as it hit me, I, you know, I immediately... <laughs> Did you, you walk me, out? No, well, no. Well, I'm, my <laughs> point, you know, exactly. That's the point, exactly. <laughs> Greetings everyone, welcome to our very first episode of the Film Biz Show. A show where we focus on the business of film and television, both locally and internationally. Now this month we are commemorating Women's Month and we will be interviewing dynamic women within the television and film industry. And the woman in which we're interviewing today is one such woman. She is an entrepreneur, public speaker, business growth coach, but her accolades don't just end there. She was also a juror for the Emmys and the Venus Television Awards, as well as a country liaison for the Oscars and so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please help me to welcome Ms. Minky Mazubukotulo. Welcome, Ma. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this very cold Johannesburg evening. Thank you for having me. It really is an honor to have you here. With likewise. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, if you um, don't mind just giving us... Um, uh, a brief background on who Minky Tulo is, where you grew up, uh, and um, who, who exactly she is. Mm, okay, so uh, I am originally from the Free State, yeah. in a small town called Kwakwa, stone throw away from Clarence. I see Clarence is, is doing its things on it Instagram. Is, yeah. Everybody's <laughs> wanting to visit Clarence. Um, so, and I spend... Most of my time, I guess, from in a very protected environment. Mm. Um, and so I, when I reflect on it, the uh, bulk of the South African tensions around inclusivity, mm. I only came to realize the whole racial tensions in the country by the time I was in varsity. Mm. Had a bit of context to it because I would visit my my grandparents in Gauteng, in, in Katlohong, mm. but mostly spent that time in Kwakwa. So, and which I, and I think it's important to share this because sometimes um, people kind of go, we all have this, as black people all have the same experience, experience mm. and history. And so I grew up with one of my mom's best friends being Tani Annette. Mm. which was an Afrikaans lady. Goodness. So in terms of, uh, we talk about simulation of the European uh, culture mm. or how we show up, I never got to... Mm. <laughs> what, is this because Clarence is more integrated than other areas? Yeah, or? absolutely. So okay. Clarence, all the way to Bokwagwa, you know, yeah. we, I mean, Sentinel was a multiracial school. Mm. Majority, even in, in those times, majority of the students there were, were black. We actually have sure. minority white people. Goodness. And so I grew up being very integrated with mm. the white society, yeah. right? And moving from that, and I think it's, um, I moved to boarding school in Bakeville, yeah. in KwaZulu-Natal, in the same boarding school. We're very integrated. Mm. I la later went on to the National Film and Video Foundation. I mean, the National School of the Arts. Yes. <laughs> we'll come to that. Yes. And I mean, the, being an art school, mm. we're just as integrated, right? Mm. Maybe we're hippies and, you mm. know, we couldn't really care about anything else. My perspective kind of changed when I, when I went to, to varsity. And at the mm. time I was at Technicon Pretoria, what yeah. used to be called Technicon Pretoria. Mm. Really didn't understand the perception from um, the black students that I was potentially a coconut or, yeah. or I was uh, privileged. Mm. What, did you find it hard to kind of relate to your own? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I, I, I think as I, I was oblivious to a certain extent yeah. that why, like, why are you making race an issue? Mm. Um, but I think once I understood the implications mm. that come out of that experience and how the system was structured, mm. then I got to appreciate I'll make you an example. Yeah. At that time, as students, we, and I actually started in theater, so mm. we were trained in theater, and we would have to go off campus to theater in, in, in town in Sunnyside. Mm. I had white friends who would say to me, do you want to lift? You know, 
well, mm. we, we can take you back and forth from, yeah. from campus. However, it clicked to me when they started saying to the other black kids, I'm not a taxi, I'm not a taxi. Mm. So right? you were the, so, you were so the special was, black. So I'm just like, <laughs> but what's the difference? Why, mm. why is the space for me in your car and there's no space for, right? Mm. Then the nuances of, well, you are different, you mm. speak differently. And I, and obviously for me, I thought, okay, this is not, because I would comfortably at mm. any time go hang out with the black students, wow. go hang out with the white students. I, 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 I was, my life was fluent between mm. any racial groupings, mm. even because being, coming from a national school of the arts, we had all, a, we're a rainbow nation. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so mm. I didn't see, but yeah, I think that was a rude, rude awakening. I also started noting that, for instance, certain black students couldn't take certain equipment when we had productions home to finish their projects mm. because, you know, the notion was that you can't take the equipment into a public, um, into public transports or taxis. Mm. There's a mm. risk, but mm. because the white students had cars, mm. they were allowed to take mm. the equipment. And because I had white friends, I you guess get in the car with I get in the car so I can take the equipment home <laughs> too, yes, you yes. know, and I think mm. at a certain point then it started becoming, I, I started not under, seeing it as just me walking in, in who I am, but also realizing that this might be a survival mechanism because mm. you then started seeing a lot of dropouts, right, from the black students because the structure was just not efficient, Ex yeah. you know. Mm. So one of the things I'll make an example is we would get an opportunity to work in the industry while in at, at varsity. Mm. So we had different industry companies or projects or events that would look for students. Mm. Black people, black students were not given that opportunity the rationale was how are you going to get there? You don't have a car, mm. right? Mm. Mm. Again, I got to tap into that space because my white friends would give me a lift. Yeah. <laughs> really, you know? Right? Mm. So I think I started being more aware and more appreciative mm. of other black students' struggles. Mm. Mm. Um, that's commendable because that can be a very uh, comfortable place to be in. Sure. You know, um, to be that, that special one, that clever one. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes a lot for a person to have empathy, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for other students of the same color who are going through a tougher struggle mm -hmm. than you. So that's, that's, very, that's a very commendable thing. Mm. Thank you. Sure. Mm. So I guess that framing just kind of then informed how I showed up once I got into the industry, yeah. right? Because something had shifted. Mm. I just realized that the space was not accommodative of the collective representation of the country. And so started in, um, but also I think I was sober enough to know that you kind of have to push to a certain level for yeah. you before you can open spaces mm. for other people and do mm. that. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how I started in 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 the industry. Started like I said, started in theatre, mm. moved from theatre really into events, working for doing events for the likes of SBC, doing SBC News Awards. I don't know if you remember your TV awards. Yes. Who did that? Yes. Um, yeah, and mm. your rent shows. Yeah. Out of that. Um, I got, I moved to the National Film and Video Foundation. Mm. And I think just in that, the, 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 the space kept on being challenging pre, you know, being at SABC or the mm. NVF. I, I remember working at um, the Joburg Theatre at some point and getting into TIFF yeah. <laughs> with the then management because I was expected to show up in a particular way, mm. right? And I wasn't because... You were an artist. I, yeah, I'm an artist, but also I come from a family that, mm. and I guess the surrounding in my growing up is that you speak up, you say okay. it when you don't like it, you know, you don't have to mm. papa, or papa tele everything, yes. you know? Mm. So mm. I realized that 
that was a problem because mm. even when I was at uh, Joburg Theatre, mm. my core crew members were very, no, oh, you don't speak like that too. Mm. Yeah, I'm just like, why? Mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. And I get, then I gain, I'm saying, I don't want to sell this narrative that every black child is disadvantaged because as much as there are other sh- structures mm. that put me under dis- to be put me to be disadvantaged now or mm. but I must, I must recognize that mm. the structures in the background that my family put me under yeah. to be in boarding school to be in an art school to mm. be in a protected environment where I grew up with alternate al- other nationalities mm. have given me some sort of privilege yeah right yeah. um so yeah yeah i like what you say when you talk about how these institutions you find are very rigid in terms of you know um, um the, just the structure and how you know you you can either question or engage with management because the very essence of the space that we're in being creativity mm-hmm. self-expression it's supposed to be dynamic mm-hmm. But I found, you know, within these institutions, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. They run it, you must toe the line. Yeah. And what happens is that that rigid approach affects the actual creative arts. That the, the, the creativity is affected on the ground. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, how, how can you, you know, one of my mentors was like, how can you put a price tag on art? It's like putting a price tag on breathing, you know. It's like, mm. and how can you cage Art. It's like caging breathing, isn't it? Yeah. You, you're supposed to just let it kind of flow in its own way and do its own work of healing, in, in my own opinion. So, uh, mm. And I hear that, but to be honest, the reality, who that owns mm. sets the rules. That's so true. Right? So the question is who owns mm-hmm. the industry? Mm. Who, who mm. owns these structures? Yeah. And who that owns will set the rules mm. that mm. everybody must conform to. That's true. Right? Mm. Mm. Creativity or not, if, yeah. you don't, if you don't own the platform, the distribution platform, you are going to subscribe to who, who, who owns who the paid the bill, who really, paid right? the bill. Yeah. Mm. But with that said, I want to touch a bit also on your journey as an academic. Sure. Yeah, because you didn't sure. just study <laughs> the creative arts at TUT. Uh, you know, what was it, theatre that you studied then? Yeah, uh, well, performing arts technology. Performance arts technology, yes. Yeah. Well, you do. I had friends who had done that. It's, mm-hmm. it's basically an all round, and uh, you pick up speakers and lights. And yeah, you do sound, lighting, makeup, yeah. stage management. Yes, all that fun stuff. Deco- props, yeah. everything. Yeah. It's like <laughs> <laughs> the, the 360, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, I guess I've always been curious, inquisitive, because when I left... Um, Technicon Pretoria, I went, I actually started with Endemol. Okay. I was actually meant to be there for an internship and mm. they ended up uh, signing me up permanently. Yeah. And at that point, I was going to be an art director. I was mm. going to be an amazing art director doing these big sets, like your gladiator mm. kind of sets. And I think the reality don't, that we don't have those kind of budgets. So, I, you know, we, we're going to buy props and do that and have smaller um, sets. Um, but just being in there, I got more curious about the ecosystem mm. of the film and television space. I've been exposed to to to, to stage, to theater, I've been exposed to events, now it's television. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, so you get there, you're like, oh, so the director is important, mm. the producer is mm. Maybe I want to be a director, a producer. But I've, I've always also loved reading mm-hmm. and kind of digging in and studying the things I'm interested in. And then I realized that space of being a director and a producer is saturated. And yet there's an entire ecosystem that comes with filmmaking. Yeah. And when the opportunity to go to the National Film and Video Foundation came, I took, I grabbed it with both hands mm. because the National Film and Video Foundation really is the national custodians mm. of developing the film industry, mm. right? Um, and that role gave me the opportunity to work with everyone across the industry. Mm. I worked with distributors, I worked with production companies, I worked with broadcasters, mm. I worked with government agencies mm. that were the like Department of Arts and Culture, IDC, that needed to fund the industry. 
I worked with, well, I guess, um, government agencies also from country to country engagements with other embassies. So it kind of gave me a broader perspective mm. of the industry. And I remember my brother saying to me, I'm probably the craziest <laughs> person he knows <laughs> because I literally mapped out a 10 year plan for myself, oh, right? So I always say to, to people, I, I believe in uh, your career playbook. Yeah. So I mapped out this thing, it's like, okay, if I'm going to understand this ecosystem, mm. I'm gonna have to understand IP, I'm gonna mm. have to understand production, mm. I'm gonna have to understand distribution, mm. I'm gonna have to understand this, regulatory and yeah. all of that. So the rest of my journey was very deliberate, mm. right? I could sit and tell, I'd tell my brothers like, okay, the next stop is I have to go to work for that company. The next stop I have to, also very clearly targeting who was the big, big, better or bigger or best player in the market at that time. Mm. So I remember when I left uh, the National Film and Video Foundation, I was recruited by New Metro Film Distribution, mm. who then were the biggest cinema, dis distribution. cinema chain and mm. distributor. Um, and I, yes, you had your state clinical competing, but in, in terms of Africa, they were the biggest. Mm. I said, they said, Let's, can you come work with us? I said, absolutely. I'll even pay, take a salary cut because wow. I need to understand distribution. That's amazing. Right? Mm, mm. And that's when I started being exposed. And I guess NFVF, I got exposed to the international market, but I also got to work more closer with the studios mm. when I was working with New Metro Film Distribution. Mm. So, yeah, and I guess, like I said, I kind of mapped up these things like, mm. this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to gain experience yeah. with whatever I study. Mm. So in terms of my academic background, I have studied in IP, Mm. or entertainment law. I have studied in um, digital management technology. I have done, I actually was invited to do a course on the the, um, the business of film and television in the global market yeah. when the whole globalization thing came, exactly. which was an amazing opportunity to mm. sit with people from all over the world mm. where we could sit down and share what are we seeing happening in our various territories mm. Um, and how is that is reshaping the the business of film and television? Yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah. bit and of a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, I mean you know having gone through that experience, do would you say that the South African television and film landscape is any more unique than any of the other territories, or are we pretty much the same? I think we underestimate ourselves. Okay. And there's most of the time the perception that, oh, the international market is better, better. than mm. us. Or they, and not necessarily. Yeah. I think one of our biggest challenges or that, that put, mm. puts us at the back foot is our funding structure of the industry holistically, not just mm. funding of a, or a film or a production, mm. but the funding of the entire ecosystem mm. Of, mm. of the film industry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, coming to that, if, if you look at it, one would say South Africa is at a huge advantage because we one of the only one of the few countries that have, you know, state backed institutions that, uh, you know, are there to kind of put money into our films. America, which is the biggest, you know, film economy in the world, still has zero budget from government to mm -hmm. invest. But but how come even with the, all the support that we get from government, we're still struggling to get our movies out there, get them going? What exactly is, what, what are we missing that we're not getting right? So one, I think the ratio between how much government can fund versus how many filmmakers and creatives are in the market yeah. just doesn't make sense, mm. right? One. Two, when we talk about government funding, that the DFIs will do, which is mm. development funders, is what in the ecosystem is being funded. Yeah. Majority of that fund is going to production, mm. to film productions. Mm. Who's funding platforms? Who's funding... It's true. Development also. Develop yeah. there's, there's so much more in mm. the ecosystem. Be and also, if you follow the money, where does the money end up mm. from? If you're getting 10 rand... From, from from your funding. Mm. How much of that money can actually can you retain as a filmmaker mm. to make you sustainable yeah. 
so that you don't queue, you don't end up in the queue again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So funny, I was in one of the panel discussions at the Devon Filmart, and one of the gentlemen mentioned that he feels as if um, you know these institutions such as the NFVF are kind of creating a dependency, hmm. you know. Um, 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 on you know the, the filmmakers, where we constantly have to get just a bit to do some work, so we can come back next year and ask for more. And even though I think it's not the intention, that's mm. essentially what the ecosystem gets to perpetuate, where we never really get to kind of break out into a space where there's an independent machinery mm. of making these films. How do you think we can get to that place where we can? Do that. So I do agree, and I think it's because for the longest time until today, South Africa's position is that filmmaking is just storytelling. Yeah. Right. There's the countries who've taken a position that they're not going to be um, narrative or storytellers, mm -hmm. but they're going to invest in being developers and manufacturers of the equipment that enables the film That's so making true. process. That's so true. Right. So I also talk about when we look at ourselves nationally, mm. where are we positioning ourselves mm. in the global film and making, uh, film and television landscape? Mm. And I want to make an example. Mm. Australia's focus mm. is that we're going to have a tourism-driven film yeah. industry, mm. right? Germany's strategy is that mm. we're going to have a localized mm. industry. And when I say it, localization driven industry, I mean. And when I say that is that there's a huge uh, representation still in Germany where whatever international film comes, I mean, when it been back then with Hollywood, yeah. when it lands, they actually have local voiceovers, mm. voiceover artists yeah. who represents like a jo there's a German mm. Jolene voice, mm -hmm. right? So if it lands, to also to preserve their languages, yeah. right? So instead of them competing with telling story against the Americans, then it was, well... We localize. We do, we focus on industry of localization, mm. which means transcripting, mm. voiceover. And so they, they drive the sector. Um, for instance, you look at um, Austria, where for them, BCX mm. was the focus. Mm. We don't have budget to produce at the same level of Hollywood. Yeah. We are going to, to a point that a lot of Hollywood movies go for post-production and v, v, uh, VFX in Austria, yeah. right? Mm. Um, hence, you have companies like Wita. Mm. France, for instance, said our focus is going to be animation. Mm. So that in the, in the globalization of film and television, the question is that where when are you, you going to play, mm. right? Mm. The UK, a lot of the American scripted content and formats mm. are actually coming out of the UK yeah. and Israel and all of those mm. places mm. where they're adopted mm. by the US, but what the US has is the budget mm. to then elevate it and then global audiences put them out there. and put it out there. Well, well, I mean, you know, this kind of reminds me of a quote that I heard. They said, during the American gold rush, mm -hmm. the people that actually made most money were not the actual miners mining the gold. It was the people who were servicing the miners. Yeah. Those who were selling the spades, those who were selling the food, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that the miners are able to, you know, uh, continue with their job. And I think yeah. that's where, as you're saying, you know, if you know, uh, it's, that's where we need to position ourselves. But I mean, what do you think of the whole industry in Cape Town? There's a lot of servicing, or there are servicing companies that are doing co-pros with, you know, uh, big uh, American uh, um, production companies. And isn't that trickling down? It Because when we say this is how much the, the the South African film industry has made for the year. Uh, I think the majority of that money comes from yeah, the Western Western our Western partners, isn't it? True, um, and again because you know we can't compete with the with exchange mm. rates. Um, <laughs> the story about Cape Town mm. um, is let's take that in the in the broader context. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where is Cape Town in the broader representation of the country? Mm. Right? That's, that's answering the question of, therefore, the accessibility of 
the industry in that context? Mm. How accessible is it for the broader majority majority in the country? Mm. Right. Um, so that's that's a challenge. Yeah. Also, the fact that till today there's only one studio. Yeah that is able to facilitate for international uh, productions of huge scales. Mm. You know, and it means not everybody can get into that studio mm. and you start competing on price, mm. right? And again, you start competing on ownership, yeah. right? So, mm. hey. But I think also we, we, we can't, we have to also look at ourselves. Absolutely. Because one thing about the Cape, you know, the Cape Town community they're very good at organizing themselves. Absolutely. You know, um, we've got beautiful landscapes in Limpopo and Bumalanga, even here in Gauteng, in which we can use and turn into big studios. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we investing in our infrastructure to call on more, you know, uh, American and, and European producers? What is it that's stopping us when you, because, and I'm asking you this because you've been on the ground for so long and I'm sure you understand, you know, these institutions from the inside out. Mm -hmm. What is it that's stopping us from, from investing uh, in, in, into these infrastructures and, and reaping the benefits? I think one is, understanding the business of film and television beyond production, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, and starting to see um, film and television from, a, from an investor's point of view versus from a creator's point of view, because mm. those need to live with each other mm. and it's not one of the or, or, the or the other, because between the two, there's the solution. But I think we also underestimate how our local ownership structure is very similar in, in America mm. or any other bigger territory. Hence, it was such a big deal when Tyler Perry opened his own yeah. studio mm. because as much as we can have all this um, representation, and I'll, I'll talk in the context of America going on around inclusivity and diversity and Black Lives Matters and mm. all of that, majority of those product, Black production companies of, of film companies do not own the ecosystem. That's true. Right. So hence it was such a big, so even when you, uh, so I know there was a hype at some point where, you know, they wanted, there was exchange of content between Ameri black Americans and, or African Americans and um, European Africans mm. to, to engage with Africa. And then we're like, but who owns the rights? Mm. Whether you whether you are an African American, whether you are mm. African African, yeah. I don't know what you want to call it, mm. but the question is who owns the ecosystem? Mm. Yes, you are the creator, but do you own the ecosystem? So and it's it's fundamentally a a an issue that has been long in discussion mm. that is not going to take just the creatives to resolve. Yeah. It's gonna take the broadcasters, it's gonna mm. take legislation mm. to Mm. to deal with but mm. so yeah mm. and i think what's happening currently now with the americans the writers and the actors on strike you know we were having a conversation earlier with some of my colleagues and we we're saying this does not start now in mm. fact south africa we we went through it with the whole generations uh, cast being fired um long ago and and yes we were using the old traditional you know uh, um uh, format, you know, mm -hmm. old traditional television format and not streaming as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Americans, they've, they've passed the hurdle long ago, at least when they were still using traditional television, they could have a conversation around usage and uh, so on and so forth. But we, we are still stuck. We, in fact, are way behind. Uh, and if, if there's anyone who should be supporting, um, you know, our American counterparts, it should be us. Yeah. Because we're going through so much. Mm -hmm. But I want to touch on the question of unity on, on you know, we, we're not a unionized kind of, a, you know, industry. Um, and do you think, you know, th that could be the reason why it takes so long for us to address some of these issues? I think at some point we need to be honest with ourselves on what the challenges on the ground is. Um, one, we do not have a big enough market. The US can afford to go and strike because there's so many alternative platforms and channels. Even with OTT coming in, IPTV coming in, the broadcast, there's so many broadcasting channels that if 
a producer or someone, an actress goes on strike, they're not necessarily going to be run out of a job, right? Mm. Now, the South African broadcasting or platforms have not grown that much. For the longest time, it's just been SBC, multi-choice, mm. and ETV. Mm. And in that context, the majority of multi-choice has been third-party channels from international. So we have a growing market in terms of the, the, the talent that's coming in, but we still have not growing the platforms that can consume the content and the volumes of the content. So the risk is that you, whether we like it or not, people will think of according to their stomachs, mm. right? If I speak up and I start being part of this thing, I might lose a job, I might not be the yeah. fit person to be put on. Whereas in, in other markets in America, and I mean, I remember having this conversation with one of our international counterparts, like, mm. I mean, we used to having like 70 channels, yeah. right, that are just has American content. Mm. What's, what's up with you guys, mm. you know? Mm. So we, I, I think the structure of the industry as well. It's different. It's different. I'll give you, I mean, an example. Today, we, I was at an audition mm. for a, uh, a mayonnaise brand. I've never seen this brand before. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the brief says they must be able to speak, uh, have an American accent. So my friend says, you know, I, I didn't understand. I didn't even get time to think, oh, why are we ha speaking American? Yeah. I don't know if it's a new brand that's coming in here and might be, you know, something comical. And she says, you know, what do you think about this commercial? I said, what do you mean? I mean, the fact that we're speaking American accent. I'm like, well, it's okay. She's like, don't you realize what's happening? The Americans are striking. They're coming here. And basically what we're going to do, they're going to pay us to do the, the jobs of the Americans at a, a fraction of the rate in which the Americans are given. Mm -hmm. And we're basically selling them out. You know, yeah. And I, as soon as it hit me, I, you know, I meet it. <laughs> Did you walk told out? Me, no, well, no. Oh, I'm, I'm, my <laughs> yeah, point. And that's exactly. The point exactly. <laughs> and everyone that I asked, like, how do you feel? They're like, oh well, what are we supposed to do? And it's almost like we're forced in a position where we're gonna sell out our yeah. colleagues across the Atlantic, and it's and it's it's actually it's 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 terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. It's terrible. Now put that into context. That ten years ago, we were producing about 23 films a year. Yeah. Um, and today we haven't moved much, yeah. you know. We're not even producing over 30 a year. Mm. So what has it telling you? The market is not... It's not growing. It's not growing. Mm. And hence, even if you look at the budgets that are coming from the funders, mm. it hasn't grown much, yeah. right? Um, so people, the broader industry understands that they are fighting for very small piece of the pie, mm. right? Because the pie is not big. And so that's when it, it starts getting, I guess, a bit ugly on the ground, yeah, you know? that's true. And they, so it's difficult to yeah. get people who are fainting for themselves. It's survival of the fittest in, this, in the South African mm. context. So to get those people to form a union, mm. How it's we, tough. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we were doing a project in Botswana and I was telling uh, some creatives there that maybe they should start seeing Botswana because Botswana only has 2 million, you know, uh, uh, 2 million population, but they've got an amazing creatives and great stories. And I, I was telling them, maybe you should guys just stop seeing yourself as an isolated country, but more as a province in a way, you know, a mm. part of a collective. Mm. Because the Botswana, in fact, the Botswana population is far more than just two million. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many in Mafiking, in you get in Pretoria, in the Northern Cape, the, the Basotho people, the Babedi people, all the content in which creators from Botswana would create will always apply to the broader Sesotho community. Mm -hmm. And doesn't it apply with us maybe at a big, broader scale to say, how about maybe as Africans, do you think there's a way in which we can see ourselves, um, you know, beyond the borders, uh, in that way, you know, we can kind of put together these numbers uh, instead of thinking we're just 50 million, maybe we are close to a billion strong. So quite interesting because I'm consulting on a project right now, which mm. is between a partnership between South Africa, Lesotho and Botswana, right? Yeah. Kind of draw, drawing from the cultural similarities mm. from uh, Lesotho and the Free State and Botswana and the Botswana's in the country. Yeah. Um, and even in that that context is 
you know, South Africa is like, South Africa, you've got money, bring them in, mm. the money. Mm. We're like, well, the reality is that we can only fund a particular portion. And then Lesotho and Botswana, we're like, where are you in terms of structurally? Mm. In, and, and that's the other thing about us, South African. We wait for government structures and well, before we can just start working with each mm. other. But also it's, it's still a financial issue to yeah. say, because even in the funds that you'll access out of South Africa, mm. the funders will state that they X amount of pos of that fund must be used in South Africa. Very so the true. portion that they're funding must be in South Africa. So mm -hmm. I can't go to an IDC and say to them, well, I'm, I'm, I want 10 rand, but I'm going to film 20% in South Africa and the rest of the 80% mm -hmm. in Lesotho and mm -hmm. Botswana. Just legislatively, it's, it doesn't it doesn't allow. Mm. It doesn't allow, mm. right? Mm. Mm. And unfortunately, we're not working from a self-funded industry. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, uh, with that said, I just um, want to ask you this question. I mean, what is it that qualifies? What what kind of projects are the kind of projects you like to be involved in? Having come such a long way in your career, what qualifies for for you know um, something that you say would would pull you? Is it money? Uh, you know what what is it in in this point in time where you are that you know that, that moves you to engage in a project? I think the one the biggest thing for me is industry development projects. Mm. So I was privileged to be to project manage the KwaZulu Natal film um, industry transformation um, initiative, mm. uh, coming up with the with the model and doing the pilot for it. So how do we develop an industry in KwaZulu Natal when it comes mm. to film and television? Uh, so industry development projects. Uh, a passion of mine. Mm. Two, when it comes to to individual projects, I guess to say, mm. I think for me what resonates is the commitment from the people that I'm engaging in. So I, if I see commitment on the project and people are willing to do the hard work yeah. to get it across the line, then I'm open to that, but obviously it's, it does not go without saying that I'm not I'm not in a position to say, oh guys, I've got so much bags of money, mm. just you know. But I mean, for me, it's really about commitment, mm. right? Mm. And it's hard to get um, that kind of commitment because everybody is is, is hustling, you That's know. That's so true. That's so true. Okay, last question: What do you believe is the mission of this generation of filmmakers? Hmm. Um, and what do you think is your purpose within the broader mission? You know, I, I mean, there's so much happening, you know, across the globe, which also directly affects us mm -hmm. with the streaming platforms coming in the fold. Um, you know, what do you believe is, is our current generational mission, especially in the South African context? Mm -hmm. And what is Minky's purpose within that whole ecosystem? So at large, I do a lot of business growth coaching. And so one is let's, let's drive towards ownership yeah. and ownership in the broader sense of the ecosystem mm. because the story, the script is but one yeah. of it, of the dependencies that we, 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 we have. Um, and two, I... I really spend a lot of time doing the consultants and in, in, in the business coaching, providing context, and I guess <laughs> handing over all the knowledge, the networks um, to people that I work with, mm. right? So sometimes someone will come with the project, I'm like, oh, and it's not, not everything is about money, yeah. right? Uh, for me is how do we move, how do I use my experience and how do I use my networks locally and globally to help the next person move a step closer. Mm. Because I don't I, I don't I think it would be naive of me to think that if I am self serving and it's all about me that mm. they can even be an industry that I can participate in. Yeah. Right? So the more of us have got more and funny enough, one of the things I, I think that has, has been very clear is we started having a couple of 
entertainment lawyers in the in, in the industry, which was never there. Never We've started to having people who are doing gap financing. Mm. Those numbers are growing. So I think we're getting there, mm. right? Yeah. Um, but we still have equipment that we don't we don't manufacture. So I uh, so part of the the work I do so I'm at the Triple um, B E ICT Council is around looking at transformation holistically. So transformation in terms of localization. Localization means we're going to have to think about these external um, heavy costs that are not allowing us to to basically to grow. grow the the sector. Such as us. Uh, mm -hmm. Manufacturing on microphones, cameras, and lights. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, um, I think we're just moving to another segment in our uh, in our podcast where we just want to have a bit of a a, a game. We call oh, this the gosh. rapid fire questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to see we want to see how much um, do you know? How much general knowledge do you have oh, of gosh. the industry? Okay. Don't worry. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Okay, first question is name the highest grossing film right now. Barbie. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Still happy to see it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, which local funder collaborated with Netflix to create six new films for their platform last year? For their platform? A local funder that collaborated. IDC. Mm -hmm. Was that? Can oh, no, NAVF. NAVF. Yeah, thank you. NAVF, I was sorry. <laughs> I said, sorry. Yes. You've worked with them. Yeah, yeah, I know. NAVF. Okay, cool. This is a bit of a inside knowledge thing. I'm not sure if you'll get it, but let's see. Which Rhythm City actor, he's now late, I'll give you a clue, used to improvise their line? I have absolutely no, no idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been on set in years. <laughs> okay, that was uh, Jamie Bartlett when he played uh, David Gennaro. Oh, nice. Yeah, he used to be uh, an amazing improviser. Okay, which local, uh, which famous local actor was the first person to win the television competition series Class Act? He currently released a movie sure called Inamba Namba. Um... Why am I tempted to say so? so what's his name? It does start with an S. Yes. <laughs> As the same, you know. And the, he even, uh -huh. Oh my gosh. I'm terrible with names. But uh -huh. I know he... Mm. He's clues. got an Afro. Yes. <laughs> if, you remember, if you remember the name of the character of Is Good Is Nice. Stumo. Yes. And then the, what's the... the Oh, you did well. Stumum Charlie. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, last one. Um, name the founders of Yellowbone Productions. This should be easy. Yeah. I actually don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, Jamil Pubega mm -hmm. and Leila Swat. Okay. Yeah. Now I know. If you were stuck on a desert island, mm -hmm and could only pick one local film to watch, what would it be? Funny enough, uh, um, what's the film that, why am I forgetting the name? I'm so terrible with names. Short in Pretoria. Mm, mm, mm. Madwetwe. Madwetwe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think there were so many things about that film that... Um, we game changing and gave hope yeah. from the funding structure mm. to how authentic mm. the, the story, story was. was, you know, I mean, to 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 start getting um, artists like Black Coffee to yeah. being Invest. investors. And so mm. I think my, my, my daughter is brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant project yeah. to kind of unpack it beyond even mm. just the story to say, how did it come about? And industry, rest in yeah. peace to Wusi Sepuinana, the actor who was leading it and yeah. was unfortunately in an altercation that cost his life. Uh, last question. If you were minister of... It's been a last question. Last, the very one. <laughs> <laughs> if you were the minister of um, sports, arts and culture for a day, how, what would you do to impact the space for that, you know, for that day? What, what, what would you implement as, as a minister? I would unbundle the 
concentration of the industry in Johannesburg and mm. Cape Town and, and, and Durban. I think there's a lot of opportunity to to look at all nine provinces yeah. and how do we develop all nine provinces, get unique South African stories. Because I think everyone we're seeing on television from a story perspective is very influenced by the city life, True. right? Yet there's so many um, cultural um, and historical stories we can mm. get. Um, I think it also reminds me of um, at the um, at the end of COVID, yeah. one of the challenges that the industry uh, had in, from a government perspective as well is that there wasn't enough skilled mm. um, filmmakers or cinematographers mm. and all of that to cover what was happening nationally, yeah. right? So even having one studio in terms of communication, it's like, if you look at the country, how many people can lift their camera mm. and actually shoot? How many people can uh, record podcast mm. in the broader mm. South Africa? It's just like a few people in Joburg and, sure. you know. So I think once, if I, if I would, I would just open the sector to the broader nation and start stimulating participation in it. Well, that's amazing. We can't wait until you're our minister. Wow. We're going to root for you, I can tell you. <laughs> well, Osminki, thank you so much for joining us today. It really has been an enlightening uh, conversation uh, with a lot to kind of think about and wonder, you know, um, as to what the future trajectory of this space will be. We also thank you for being a dynamic woman with, within the film and television industry and being an all-round, just a, a mother to so many of us. So we thank you so much. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank, thank you. you. And we'd like to say thank you to the Dynamic Workspaces, the Magic Lightbox, and as well as Fortune Well for making this podcast possible.